Have you ever been to a buffet? A really good buffet. You know, the ones that have the crab legs and the chocolate fountain. And even though you know you're full, you just keep going back for more. For TV viewers, that's the agony and the ecstasy of living through the second golden age of television. And 2022 was no exception. Streaming services, premium cable, and even, gasp, the networks kept churning out spectacular new series and incredible seasons of continuing shows. And we just kept loosening those proverbial belts and shoveling them in. With so many incredible hours of television released this year, it's impossible to have seen it all. So with our panelists are here to share their favorites as the great pop culture debate presents the best TV of 2022. I consider myself a fun uncle, but unlike Damon Targaryen, I draw the line at feeling up my nibblings at the brothel. I'm your host, Eric Resniak. Please help me welcome our amazing panel. See Her and Land Her are two different people. It's Ama Marfo. I don't want to hold us. Let's get going. Let's get going. She also took her fashion identity from Steve Jobs, but thankfully won't be going to prison for investor fraud anytime soon. I hope. It's Kate Rakulia. Yes, that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> and was that actually your impression of the dropout? Or was that no, you? Did... This is my impression of the dropout. I very good. good. I, no. a little bit, I don't know what I sound like. I sound kind of like Miss Piggy doing... <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to stand for this, this piggy slander, so I we're know, just going to move on. Sorry, we're going to move on. We're going to move on. <laughs> and for this episode, we have not one but two special guest stars that we are delighted to welcome. First, a pop culture journalist who writes A Waste of Time on Substack. It's Delia Puniskew. Welcome, Delia. Thank you so much. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. And we're so glad that you are. And I just discovered five minutes ago that she's actually the high school classmate of one Ama Marfo. Mm -hmm. So it's like through the looking glass, someone else can talk about their high school misadventures and you all get to listen. So I'm delighted. Thank you, Delia. Thank you. Go Lions. (laughs) Go Lions. (laughs) And finally, from the Rewatch Recap podcast, it's Dustin Holden. Hi, Dustin. Hey, how's it going? Hey. I don't know why I did that. that, that that's that's like a okay. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's been, that was a bad the rewind re-watch. impression. I was getting scrappy do, but I was getting I me was too. Getting oh, okay, also. I'll take yeah. it. I'll take it. Yeah, it's TV. It's thematic. We're good. So our best of episodes are a little bit different than our usual format. There's no polls. There's no brackets. There's barely even any debating. Our panelists are just going to do a pop culture show and tell on our individual top three TV series for the year. These could be brand new shows released in 2022 or great new seasons of continuing shows that aired over the past 12 months. Do you disagree with some of our picks? Do you want to add your own to the conversation? Head to greatpopculturedebate.com and leave a comment on this episode or find us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Mastodon, Hi, Facebook, whatever, I don't know, and tell us what you think. With that out of the way, let's get to these top three picks. I'm going to start in alphabetical order, and that means Ama is up first. Ama, take it away. So I'm going to start with A Friend of the Family, which was a miniseries on Peacock that was a dramatization of the story of Jan Broberg. And Jan Broberg was a young woman who got abducted by a family friend uh, twice, uh, it, once as a preteen and then once again as a slightly older teen. And I originally got into it. I'm not normally a true crime person, um, but I had seen something explicitly framing a friend of the family as the type of true crime that did everything right in direct opposition to something like Dahmer, which a lot of people feel did it wrong. And that was such a stark positioning that I was like, I got to see what this is about. And I got captivated so quickly. Um, The story itself is really interesting, but the way that they told it um, to me was really unique in the sense of like, we're not dramatizing a killer. We're not dramatizing somebody that did something wrong. We're showing them as the person that did the wrong thing. We're showing the family's choices and how they recognize what they learned and wanted other people to learn. It had deep involvement from the Broberg family. Jim Broberg uh, is in the beginning, appears in the finale. um, And then just like at every point, it was done with the kind of respect and care that I feel like so many other miniseries is both documentary and fictionalized, just don't really seem to have. Um, So I really, really appreciated that and just loved it. It was fascinating. And every time it ended, I was like, I got to know what happens next. It's incredible. It's just absolutely gripping. And like, it's such a wild story to think like, well, (laughs) how could this family let their daughter be taken twice? And then you watch it and you're like, oh, because that's how like, like, 
you know, um, sociopathic grooming works. Like they're just, this is their reality and it makes sense. Like it's just, it's, it's such a good show and it's so well done. I also love it. Delia, you also watched it? I did. I watched it and I am deeply fascinated by the story. I had also seen the documentary on Netflix a couple of years ago. I feel like it was one of the first things I watched at the very, very beginning of the pandemic back when we thought like, we'd just be home for two weeks. So this was like just a wild thing I was talking to my friends about. Um, And then of course the pandemic got much worse and I forgot all about it. I have to say I watched it week to week and I really liked the way they wrapped it up, but for whatever reason, it didn't do it for me. And I keep wondering if it's because I just find the actual story so upsetting that I'm not able to enjoy the show because it really just is a deeply traumatic and awful, awful thing that this horrible sociopath did. Um, He's terrible. And so I terrible, terrible monster, monster, <laughs> a true, true monster. Um, but I keep thinking about it. And now that more and more people are watching it and they're talking about it, I think I'm going to have to sit with my own feelings and truly like, <laughs> think if if I can separate how I feel about the story from how I feel about the show right now I can't well that was a question I had for Amma and Kate is I had watched the Netflix documentary a few years ago had either of you watched that before you'd seen a friend of the family I hadn't like I knew vaguely about the story but I didn't watch the documentary beforehand yeah. And so I was like, I sw- I feel like I've already seen this. And as I watched the trailer, I was like, oh, we watched that. I said that to my partner. He had no recollection of it because, as you pointed out, Delia, it falls into that, like, that haze that was, like, the first six months of 2020 where uh-huh. it was just, like, nothing was clear. Um, but, yeah, I am intrigued. People love it. And it's been one of those things that really people get uh, excited about. Dustin, have you watched it? I have not, but and mainly kind of for the reasons that Delia was describing, kind of like I could probably get into the story of it, but knowing that it's true and that it actually happened to somebody, it's going to take away from that enjoyment of watching in a way. It's more like I can listen to a true crime podcast, no problem, but like seeing it reenacted in front of my face, it kind of bothers me. So it's kind of like it's one of those weird things. If it's fictional, I could probably totally watch it, but knowing that it's true, it uh, kind of ugh, gives me the... What? Yeah. One thing that does help is that the real Jan Broberg is an executive producer on the show and was very involved in the whole production of it. And so she even has a small role at the end, which I think is lovely because part of Jan's story as a child is that she wanted to be an actress. Mm-hmm. And so it does help. It doesn't feel like we're exploiting her story or her trauma because she really fully agreed and signed on and was an active part of this production. That is good and important, I think, especially, again, you mentioned the Dahmer stuff. That's one of the big backlashes for that was is like no one who was involved in that case was okay with that being made. And that doesn't necessarily mean that as a creator, you can't make something like that. I respect that. But you have to deal with your re-traumatizing people. And a lot of these people will never get over what happened to them. So it, it's kind of a, um, I don't want to say a roll of the dice. That seems far too trivial. But um, it sounds like they did do this the right way. So thank you, Ama, for bringing that up and great discussion on that. Uh, I will move on to my first pick, which is The Sandman on Netflix. If you listen to our best of books episode which came out earlier this week you heard me blather on about how neil gaiman's miracle man the silver age finally saw print in 2022 after literally not an exaggeration 40 years of creative gestation prepare yourself to get a kind of deja vu don't worry there's not a disturbance in the dreaming because the same thing is more or less true for this live action adaptation of his 90s graphic novels which gaiman has been trying to make happen for more than 30 years at one point it was intended to be a film series starring joseph gordon levitt but given the serial nature of the sandman tv always seemed like a more logical narrative fit i just worried if any budget could possibly be big enough to fully realize gaiman's fantastical at times biblical epic and this really is a 
epic of a graphic novel series. But I needn't have worried because Netflix allegedly paid up to $15 million per episode of this show. And every penny of that budget is on the screen. From the sprawling dreaming to the depths of hell, although honestly they just could have used my mom's house for that set, The Sandman (laughs) looks like a big budget film and it is an exceedingly faithful adaptation to the comics that have entranced outsiders from Gen X onward. I found the series gripping, well-paced, and it reminded me of the magic of the property I experienced when I first read it as a teenager. They stripped out a lot of the DC comic elements that were initially a part of the first arc of the comic and made the show overall stronger. And if nothing else, the diner episode is one of the most disturbing things I saw on TV all year, as well as the masterful dream sequences in the Rose Walker arc, especially the ones guest starring John Cameron Mitchell, which I was just sitting there watching them just my mouth agape, like, holy shit, how did they do this? Um, Tom Sturridge is suitably restrained as Morpheus slash Dream, a role that requires him to be pensive, silently furious, less silently furious, and exasperated. There's not a lot of levels for our protagonist, but it's the supporting cast that really shines here. Much complaining was had by internet neckbeards over the race and gender swapping of some roles, including Lucian, Dream's major domo, played here brilliantly by Vivian Ashampong. I'm sure I just obliterated her name. Uh... Uh, Lucifer played by Gwendolyn Christie John Constantine now Joanna Constantine played by Jenna Coleman and especially Death played by Kirby Howell Baptiste all of the changes were unquestionably for the better and the actors all nailed their portrayals it bears mentioning that in the 90s for comic books they were not particularly inclusive but the Sandman was one of the few titles that say introduced LGBT characters prominently the fact that supposed fans would now complain about the TV adaptation being even more more inclusive is disappointing, but not surprising. I'm excited about where things left off with the series, and I hope Netflix can keep up this level of creative and financial support instead of being distracted by some other shiny, cheaper thing, because that is the only way this dream is going to be realized fully. And that's my main concern, because I thought they killed it in the first season. I really want them to get through the whole thing with this level of execution. Ama, I saw you nodding your head a lot during that. I'm assuming, A, you've watched it, and B, have an awareness of the comics. So I have an awareness of the comics. I've not watched the show, oh. but for me, I just I'm excited that they took on something that ambitious um, because it is something that's just like needed to be told. It it's a difficult and ambitious adaptation, like you mentioned. But the fact that they seem to have gotten it so right, I think, is really a testament to when Netflix decides they want to commit to something, and that is a big if. Um, They can do beautiful things with it. And I think any representation that gets wrapped up in the process of that is is a net positive because I don't really care what a neck beard says. Like, it is better when you have that. And especially if it's like, if the source material calls for that and you're like, "Eh, it didn't. I'm like, you didn't understand what was happening. Correct. So kudos to everybody involved for not giving a shit what the internet might say and doing the right thing to make this look like the potential viewership. Yeah, great. Dustin, have you seen it or read the comics by any chance? I have not seen it. I have not read the comics. Um, I read some of the spinoff comic for Lucifer because of the mm-hmm. show Lucifer, since it was loosely based on that. Yeah. And this character, you know, so um, but I didn't No, I never did. I had friends who who loved it and wanted to see more. And thankfully, it looks like they they picked it up in the second season. So um I just, I don't know. I don't, I just never got, I guess maybe it was too hyped up for me at the time. I might come back to it later and watch it, but sometimes when something's way too hyped up and I'm like, I, I can't watch this is not going to live up to <laughs> the, what everybody wants it to be. And I'm going to be disappointed. So I'm going to stay away from it. So totally get now. that. It's the same reason I've literally never seen avatar to this day. So I have watched Actually- 45 <laughs> minutes of that and I had to turn it off. It was so boring. <laughs> and I'm not going to see the sequels. Um, Delia, Kate, either one of you either see the show or read the comics. Kate, I think I introduced you I've, to the comics. I've read the comics. Yeah. When you said the diner episode, I was like, Ugh. yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, I haven't seen it, though. And I think it, I actually it was interesting when I was like, yeah, I want to do TV. And then I'm like, did I watch a lot of TV this year? I actually didn't. I didn't watch a lot of TV this year. And I don't know why or how or I just don't remember it. Or like you said, like, there's just so much. So. The Mm -hmm. stuff that I'm talking about is the stuff that I remembered watching, right? And I just like, yeah, I feel like I let a lot of stuff fly by me. That's okay. Delia, did you happen to see it? I didn't, but someone that I do trust uh, very much recommends it highly. So I will be watching it soon. Um, My 
problem is that I get a little too scared. So if anything is particularly spooky, I exclusively have to watch it at home in daylight. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it take, it really uh, cuts down on the time that I can watch that type <laughs> of content. Um, I basically have to like parental guidance myself. Uh, but I have heard the best things and I've heard how absolutely beautiful it is. And I'm just so happy to hear that something that has such like a strong fandom um, was able to be made for television in a way that really honors that. Um, that's great. And you actually just reminded me, this is actually super important. If you have not watched it and you are interested in watching it, my partner wished that someone had given him a trigger warning for this show. If you do not like abuse to animals, you need to be aware that there is something that happens in the first episode that I, I it, it's upsetting, but I think it'll be fine. But there is an episode late in the season. I believe it was actually technically a bonus episode that was released after the season wrapped. It's an animated episode. It's about cats. I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and skip it because there's something really traumatic that happens in the first part of it. Literally, my partner got up. I hope he doesn't mind me saying this on this podcast. I, I was like, oh, no, they're not going to do this. They're not going to do this. Not gonna... And then it started to happen. And he literally got up, walked out of the room, closed the door, and he didn't come back. So like, we're, um, done. we're done. We're done that's, nope. Yeah. So just please be aware that if that is something that's an, a concern for you. Just go ahead and skip that episode because um, it it does really turn out in, in a very beautiful way. It's a, it's a wonderful episode, but it is very difficult in that moment. With that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Kate to talk about her first pick. So my first pick, kind of in the spirit of A Friend of the Family, uh, dramatizing true stories uh, is The Dropout. Um, I am a connoisseur of the Elizabeth Holmes uh microcosm collection of materials i've read the john carrie you book uh listened to the various podcasts like what else is there to know or to be gained from watching the story again right and i think that was partially kind of how i came to the show and the show makes such an extraordinary case for Yes, you know the story, all of you people who can't get enough about the Elizabeth Holmes story, which for those who don't know, and I assume listening to this podcast know, Elizabeth Holmes is the uh, blonde, very low-voiced, very young female uh, founder of Theranos, which turned out to be um, a dud uh, biotech company that raised billions of dollars and then went all kerflui when it was revealed that this whole time she was raising money for a product that everybody knew did not actually work. Um and it's just a, what it's like a great American con story that's also about Silicon Valley. It's about gender and business. It's about all of these things, which I think is why it's such a compelling story. It just is a locus of all of these like thorny things that are all kind of wrapped up in the same thing. And this um, mi this miniseries, which I believe it's directed, produced by Michael Showalter. I think he was involved. I think he directed yeah, a couple episodes involved in some. It's very funny. Um, it's very smart. Uh, it really sort of like is, you know, telling Elizabeth Holmes's story based on all of the reporting that has happened around it. But it is also talking about the milieu that allowed her story to happen. Right. It's not just about it's not like just pillaring her. It's like this entire Silicon Valley cult and the ways that power sort of like could look the other way because they wanted to believe that this young, beautiful kind of strange female like billionaire was going to like push a magic button and fix a thing. Um, and it, it's really great. Also, my God, the needle drops in this show are extraordinary, whether it's like when she's a teen listening to the, I'm in a hurry to get things done uh, like that. And I don't know why song is just so peak being like a very intense teenager in the late nineties. Um, there's also an incredible using, uh, Katy Perry's, uh, firework to explain why Walgreens and specifically, um, oh, I forget what his name is. Dr. Dr. J, uh, is the actual guy's name, but not the base, not the basketball, uh, Cameron from, um, uh, Alan, what's his name? The guy who plays Cameron in, uh, Ferris in, Bueller. Yeah. Oh, uh, Al Alan Rock. Thank you. Yes. Alan Ruck is the executive at Walgreens who is like, he's sad and he sees this like this paper bag flying and he's like, yeah, I can be a firework. This, let's <laughs> get Walgreens to invest in this thing. It's just, it's so good. Oh, God. Um, and there's this, and also 
unbelievable performances by uh, um, Amanda Seyfried, Naveen Andrews, is Sunny Balwani, her like much older boyfriend, and a, also a CTO, like just really not great. But there's an unbelievable scene on her birthday where they all make Elizabeth Holm masks and she and Sunny dance around to Jealous <laughs> by Nick Jonas <laughs> while wearing the masks. It's So there are these moments that are clearly like creative license with this big story that make it very entertaining while at the same time being really a portrait and an indictment of a system. It's a great show. Loved it. Did anybody else watch it? That's one where I like I wanted to watch it and it just completely escaped me. I will. Yeah, com- it'll it'll I will keep admit. when you watch it. You'll be like, this is great because <laughs> I was following that story as it was unfolding, given what Kate and I both do for work. That's one of the things that I was watching. Yeah. And so like I, I knew of it and I love Amanda Seyfried. So did anybody else happen to watch it, Delia? I did. I watched it. I loved it. I watched it week to week. One thing yeah. that I think is really fascinating is that even though there was already so much pre-existing information about Elizabeth Holmes and the story and Theranos, um, her trial was happening while they were in production for this um, TV show. And so when a bunch of her text messages were subpoenaed and went into public record, they were able to use those text messages to actually rewrite some lines of dialogue in real time. Wow. So it really was like the most current representation of what that story is, um, which is absolutely fascinating. And I agree. Amanda Seyfried did an incredible job. I just really feel like I'm in the Seyfried hive. I think she is amazing. I think we <laughs> don't is. give her enough credit. Um, mm-hmm. I love her and her farm animals upstate. Um, <laughs> and the scene of her doing that little puffer jacket dance, Like, I felt cringe inside my bone marrow as I watched it. And every time I see it reposted online, I feel the same feeling over and over again. And the fact that this one little movement could elicit such a visceral reaction for me is like, she deserves her Emmy and any other awards she will win from this. Amazing. Um, uh, Dustin, did either one of you happen to watch it? I didn't. I, I, I didn't. I watched the I watched the memes. So I, I watched it through the you form of the memes. It. Yeah. Yeah. I did. And and I'm excited to watch it because Kate, like you, like I read the Carrie you book and loved it and like listened to all the podcasts. And I yeah. think it just it hit at a time of year where like I was because it was pretty early in the year. If early, I remember. Yeah. yeah. So I was like still kind of overwhelmed from things that I hadn't watched from the tail end of the previous year. And like, again, it's just there's there's so much to get through. And I didn't hit. But I'm like, I'm especially intrigued by like the creator of New Girl taking on the uh, the Theranos story. And like that part to me, I was just like, that's going to be fascinating. So like, it, it doesn't surprise yeah. me that it's funny. It doesn't surprise me that it's like focuses on the idiosyncrasies. I think that's a really trademark piece of how she writes and works. Um, so I'm excited for it. And at some point I will get to it. I don't know if they stop making TV anytime soon, but <laughs> it's, it's one that I'm sad to have missed, even yeah. if I did get to experience through the meme. Yeah. I feel like the shows that I kind of stuck with, honestly, were not the ones that dropped in a binge. They were the ones that were like, here's three episodes and it's going to be once a week because you could kind of had time to catch up to it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that was how I watched Dropout. That was how I watched Friend of the Family. Um, it's how I watched Los of Spook. All right, yeah. we'll talk about that in a minute. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Spoilers, Kate. Sorry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, with that being said, let's move to Delia. What about your first pick? So thank you so much. My first pick is Starstruck, um, the BBC slash HBO Max show created by and starring the absolutely wonderful Rose Matafeo, who is a New Zealand um, writer, comedian, actress, overall genuine ray of sunshine and delight. Um, Starstruck actually came out in 2021 and um, the second season was released in 2022 it is a rom-com show, um, and because it's British, there's only six short episodes per season. Um, I discovered it one night. I was home. I was sort of browsing through, trying to find something, and it was like that perfect thing you didn't even know you were craving. And all of the first episode, first season was already up, and I just binged it all in one night. You know, it takes about three hours. 
Um, and it's just so funny. It's such a delight. The premise is in the pilot. She is this just sort of like funny, lost 20 something living in London. Um, she works at a movie theater. She's out for New Year's Eve and she goes home with a guy she meets at the club, um, has this one night stand, wakes up in the morning and discovers that he's a movie star. Um, and so it's it's not the first time this type of story has been done, but the way that she does it is just so endearing. She really is, you know, her humor is really self-effacing. Um, it's also very current, very modern, very feminist. Um, and so the first season is really about, like, do I want to date a movie star? Um, not, oh, my God, a movie star picked me. So it really sort of flips that narrative around. Um, And then the second season is what is it like to have a relationship with a movie star? Can it even work if you're still just trying to be a normal person? Um, It's just so sweet. And I can't say enough good things about it. And I know that there's a lot of conversation about like the return of the rom-com. But I think that if you know where to look and if you are watching things like Starstruck, really the rom-com never left. Sure. Yeah, I agree with that completely. It's always been there. It just hasn't been getting as much attention for whatever reason. So Uh, I'm doing my small part to bring uh, more attention to Starstruck and Rose because I talk about having just a huge girl crush on someone. She is, I can't say enough good things about her. She's amazing. Fabulous. Now, Ama, (laughs) you were nodding. Had you seen it? I have. Yeah. Uh, Starstruck was one of my, I don't remember if it made the podcast top three, but it was one of my best shows of last year, season one. And season two, like Rand did not walk to watch it and it held up because I think when you have as strong of a first season as Starstruck had, um, you want that magic to hold. Yeah. And I think that it did. Like, I really, really liked it so much. And I think I too am a, a, a strong, active avid member of the Rose Matafeo fan club. Like, Deli, if you want to get jackets, let me know. We write um, it on. <laughs> we do. And I, th- I think she's doing something so interesting with the rom-com in the sense that, like, most iterations we've seen of it have been, like, the woman is gung-ho, waiting to fall in love. Like, this is the thing that she wants. And Rose Matafeo, not just in this, but also, like, in her stand-up hour, which is, I watched that this year as well. It's probably one of the best stand-up hours I've seen in a long time. The last three minutes is probably one of the last, the best three minutes of an end of a special I've seen in years. So watch that as well. It's called Horn Dog. It's very funny. Um, But so much of her work is about flipping the idea of like, what if the woman doesn't, isn't the one that wants that? What if the woman like wants to stay independent, has things for herself and is reluctant to kind of buy into that narrative? Um, Starstruck does that. Her special does that. Another movie she did fairly recently called Baby Done does that as well. Um, and it's just, you don't see that perspective uh, represented often slash enough. And I just love that she does it. And it's so funny and it's believable and yeah, you just kind of want to keep going back and the six episodes is up and you're like, I need more now. I'm pretty sure as soon as I watched through the first time, I was one of those, like, I immediately restarted it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I should also mention one thing that I sincerely love about it is that it is a rom-con where both leads are not white. And it's absolutely great to see, you know, um, I have his name, uh, Nikesh Patel, who plays Tom the the movie star and Rose herself, you know, it's great to see a, a brown leading man, um, an Indian leading man who is so cute, so charming, so delightful. Um, he's also the love interest in Four Weddings and a Funeral, the Mindy Kaling TV remake. Um, and so I just, I love everything about it. Just a hundred percent across the board, no notes. Do you know if it's coming back for season three? It is coming back for season three. Um, it looks like they're going to drop the first episode by the end of this year, but that might just be in England. Um, mm. So we can definitely expect it on our side of the Atlantic in 2023. Excellent. Thank you for that. Now, Dustin, speaking of shows that people started over as soon as they finished it, I know several people who do that for, I believe that your, your first pick, go ahead and take it away. 
Uh, you talking about Heartstopper? I'm talking about Heartstopper. <laughs> okay, yeah, that was my first pick. Okay, yeah, uh, um, <laughs> I I read the books. I got Bob into the the graphic novels, um, and he was like, "Oh my god, he read faster than me." Of course, he just devours them. Mm-hmm. So, but the graphic novels um, were written by Alice Oseman, and it's based on characters from another uh, a young adult novel she wrote called Solitaire. And these characters showed up as kind of background characters, and people liked that those characters. So she made them the main couple in this um, adaptation of how they met, a backstory of everything. And um, she also wrote the screenplay or the teleplays for the for the show. And it's an awesome show. It's a great book. They they both are equally. It's one of those things where the the show or the you know the media form like it picked up on the feeling from the books. And it made you feel like I just oh my gosh I read the book and it just felt like wow did, why didn't I have this when I was in high school like yeah. it, it gave me the like the warm and fuzzies inside just everything was perfect great love story no big antagonistic things happen but you're, they still got that the average like um, teenage strife and um, they're trying to uh, one of them's in the closet one of them isn't and and uh, it's all about telling their friends and the, and. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. And then when you watch the show, she expands on some of the background characters. So you get more focus on the lesbian couple that goes to the girls' school. And you get more focus on the trans character who's also at the girls' school now. And and uh, it, it really – it didn't hurt it at all. It, like it just – it helped it so much. And I can't – I mean, I don't, I don't know if it sounds like <laughs> – Sorry, I'm getting all flustered because I really like the show. Um, it's okay. <laughs> it's just it's a gay romance, you know. It's just about these kids who who find each other, and one of them's like the typical kind of geeky kind of you know uh, you know um, outcast kind of gay character who just has a small group of friends, and then there's this guy who he meets, and he's on the rugby team, and he's you know popular and a jock, and and they just kind of form this romance, you know, and. And it's all about what the guy, whether is he, am I gay? Am I straight? Am I bisexual? What am I, you know, it's all about his coming of age thing. And, and it's all about this other, you know, the other boy, you know, his insecurities about being liked by one of the popular jocks in school and they're kind of hiding it from everybody. And, oh, it's so good. It's so, so good. And I can't, I can't praise it enough. It's, and and breakout stars like all around, like, um, Charlie is played by Joe Locke and Kit Connors, Nick Nelson. Those are the, t- that's the couple, but the, uh, the main one, uh, t- the trans actress, Jasmine F- Finney, she plays L is also going to be in Dr. Who coming up. Oh, great. Um, I'm thinking pretty soon, uh, and, uh, is going to play another character named Rose, which is a whole thing with Dr. Mm-hmm. Who. So, but, uh, yeah, I, I really recommend it. it's on Netflix. It's 30 minute episodes. I think six, eight episodes, something like that six episodes probably and it's the first two graphic novels are in season one so great now i will admit that i'm a bad gay dustin and i still have not watched hard hard stopper i I, and i know (laughs) and it's not that i I know i will love it and and um i i will get to it eventually but i do think it's this was a really good year for gay romances in media right because you had hard stopper you had uh fire island you had bros um and of those i feel like hard stopper is interesting the only one I didn't see get pushback from the gay community. Uh, the, the other ones got a lot of criticism for various aspects of it, but I have heard nothing but praise about Heartstopper, and not just from LGBTQ people. I've heard yeah. it al- also from a lot of women. I haven't heard it that much from straight men. That's not surprising, but I know a <laughs> lot of women who have watched it and are like, loved it, devoured it, immediately went back, watched it over again. Um, and uh, is that true for anyone else on this panel? Did anybody else watch it? So I, I did not. Oh, oh. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> oh, so I haven't watched it, but I have been saving it for I'm like when you feel blue because I know I will watch it and I will just. Yeah, um, same. I heard. I've, I know a lot of. Uh, I've heard a lot of positive affirmation, and I've heard a lot of like cried. I was so happy. A lot yes. of happy crying. Mm-hmm. Oh, so yeah. I, I am the type of person who needs like a great deal of preparation to cry. Um, it's a long <laughs> recovery process. Um, so I have to be like, don't have anything to do, uh, all those things. So it is on that list for when I like need that boost, but also I'm prepared for the physical aftermath of it. Yeah, it's not really, it really is a happy cry. It really is. It's one of those ones. It does take it out of you a little bit, but you're just like, I feel so good now. I can face my day. Right. Like that kind of cry, you know. Dustin, I just can't spare the moisture at this point <laughs> in my life, you know? Drink a ton of water beforehand. <laughs> you got to hydrate. Um, I it's true. I mistakenly thought that it would be too juvenile when it first came out. And then, of course, I started hearing really amazing things. And by that point, 
I just got way too wrapped up in other things I was watching. Um, but a good friend of mine, Lauren Katz, wrote a beautiful piece in Vox about the impact that Heartstopper was having within the gay community. And she talked to both um, teens, current teens who either like used it as inspiration to come out to their families um, or just felt very validated by seeing these relationships within the show. And then she also talked to older uh, people in the queer community who say that it felt like they were healing their inner child watching it. And I just thought that was really beautiful. So it's definitely on my list. And I agree with Kate. I'm also saving it for like a gloomier period, maybe January when, you know, you've got like a snow and you're snowed in and you can just have a nice happy cry. Right. It's like, I just want my old <laughs> yeah. like dusty heart to yeah. beat again. <laughs> yes. Yes. I just want to believe. I want to feel feelings again. <laughs> You also just Zoom call it and just watch it all together. And- oh, <laughs> that's sweet. Yeah. Well, very nice. Thank you, Dustin. That's a great pick. And I know a lot of people who would have been very upset if it was not here this year. So thank you for doing that. Uh, with that, we are going to take a quick break and we'll be right back for round two of our picks after these messages. Welcome back to our best of 2022 TV episode. We're going to move right on to our second round of picks. And Ama, you're up again. So I feel like I'm caping for the uh, second and third tier streaming services this year, which doesn't normally happen. Um, But my second. Yeah, no. One time. Well, you'll find out two times for Peacock. But I have a pick from Freebie of all places. Uh, The. Yes, from what was formerly IMDb TV, now the atrociously named Freebie. Yeah. Um, but they had a real gem this year in a show called Sprung. And let me first say that, like, we've had our burst of content of, like, things that happened during or about the pandemic. And a lot of, a lot of folks have moved past that. And I was pleased because I think kind of reliving the earlier stages of the pandemic especially while we're still in it just feels i'm like i don't want to do this again Mm -mm. um but sprung is a really interesting one so the premise of it is this trio of folks who were let out of prison when covid hit early and they were trying to reduce the impact of its spread in prison so those that were out on relatively good behavior and it includes uh, one pr- prisoner uh, played by Garrett Dillahunt, who I always love and is so, so funny, um, his cellmate um, and who he lit, who he finds out later on in the pilot, uh, his distance girlfriend who he was connecting with from the cell below, like through the toilet. And they were like having a relationship, but he had described himself very differently. And then he had, kind of had to confront the lies that he had told when they all go to stay at this, his roommate's mother's house. and. The mom's kind of like a scammer as well. And they ultimately just come to a point where they're like, what scams can we run that are like pandemic specific? So there were people that were like, had a, mar- a black market on toilet paper. Um, there were, there was like package stealing from like things that people would get in the mail. And then they ultimately decide that they're going to um, steal from a congresswoman who was like part of the insider trading things that were happening when they knew that the pandemic was coming and she like traded on that information. So they decided to steal from her. And it's really funny in the sense of like any kind of heist comedy, it's got all the elements of that, but it also has like these really sweet emotional beats at the end of every episode. Cause Garrett Delhunt's character, the main guy is just like, I don't want to participate in crime. I just got out of jail. I have this opportunity to get my life back and do something different. Like he wanted to be a teacher and was like really interested in doing something different, but also kind of recognized that the crime piece was part of him getting back on his feet. So if you watch My Name is Earl, uh, it's, it's also a Greg Garcia show. So it has that element of like, how can I do a bit of good to pay off the bad that I did? So there's one episode where, um, one of the people that's helping them steal toilet paper, he goes and takes it and is just like throwing it to people like newspaper delivery style, (laughs) like to the neighborhood to make sure that everyone has toilet paper. Um, He reconnects with his parents who are now in this uh, like senior living home on the West coast. And like he talks to his parents about how nobody's allowed out 
in the senior home because everybody's so susceptible to getting sick. So he gets like those plastic bubbles that people have for like playing like bouncy soccer or whatever and donates them all. Like he steals them from one place, but donates them to the community so the residents can go outside. Like it's got like these really sweet pieces that kind of remind me of like, of all the bad stuff that happened over the course of the pandemic, there were moments where people really looked out for each other and it found really nice ways to bring that back. So atrociously named freebie gave this incredibly sweet and really funny show in sprung. I don't think we get another season. I don't really see how you do it, but I'm just so glad to have found it. And it was so lovely. So can I ask a question? Cause I actually am not familiar with freebie. Is it actually free? It is. Yes. So, so you, you can do it. You can do it through uh, Amazon prime video. It's like a separate section. Um, and yeah, it's free. There are ads, but not too many. That's fine. I mean, hey, ads, we grew up that way, right? It seems ridiculous exactly. to me now that we actually have to say, like, I can live with ads. Like, and I'm like, yeah, some... no, I loved ads. <laughs> I like I was an advertising major. I actively still watch TV with ads. But but I do think that freebie is like an interesting place in the sense that like there are some things that aren't streaming any other place that you can kind of get there. Like Mad Men, as someone who watched Mad Men the whole way through and knows that it is nearly impossible to stream, it is on freebie with ads, Mm. but you can watch it. Um, And they're also going to be the home of, well, I don't know when this episode is coming out. By the time it comes out, it'll probably will have just started. The America's Test Kitchen reality competition show oh. uh, is going to be on freebie. And as a super fan of America's Test Kitchen and the Cook's Illustrated Industrial Television Complex, I'm very excited for that. Great. Well, there you go, folks. Here's some news you can use. Did anybody else happen to watch Sprung? I was not aware of it. I kind of saw, and I think a pop-up ad on my Prime video come up for it and I, I didn't know i saw garrett dillahunt and I, I didn't know anything about it it looked i guess the ad like it was just a picture and it looked a lot darker than what you're describing you know what i mean which i hate mm-hmm. when they do that they don't advertise it right so this doesn't look light enough for that because i loved like i didn't i, I wasn't big my name is earl but i would love raising hope and it's the same creator yeah and martha plimpton is there as well so it's right. uh burton virginia but they're not together they play like different roles for each other but yes right. if you liked raising hope you will love this it's I wonderful love martha plimpton because she, yes. she went on to the real o'neills which she was great in that yep and yeah i, I loved her to death so i'm definitely dustin, gonna probably check it out dustin i think you'll really like it if you like yeah, so cool, cool awesome she's america's favorite goonie i will not hear anything other to the There's contrary no, i mean <laughs> mouth but Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But she was my favorite Goonie um, because she had the audacity to call out being a babysitter without getting paid. So thank you very much, <laughs> Ama. Appreciate that. Uh, I will move on to my second pick, which is She-Hulk Attorney at Law on Disney+. Plus. I am slightly embarrassed that two out of three <laughs> of my picks are comic book adaptations. But just I like, guess... Oh, own it. Own I have it. a brand. <laughs> And that brand is low class flair delivered with an artistic <laughs> aspiration, which seems very fitting for me. It's like when you make Velveeta shells and cheese and you throw in some like microwave vegetables and it's like, look, I'm classy. That's that's me. Yeah, you like wipe the edge of the plate and you're like, it's mm-hmm. cuisine. Put a little fresh parm on top. <laughs> yep. Bone ape tits. <laughs> so <laughs> I also oh think that it's an accurate description of Marvel She-Hulk Attorney at Law. Yes, it is a comic book show. There's no getting around that fact. But actually, the show doesn't want to get around it. It actually luxuriates in knowing that it's a comic book show and taking the piss out of that genre beyond like beyond explicitly in the season finale, like to a jaw dropping degree. It's also totally different from any other Marvel show we've ever had before. It's a half hour comedy. That's just as much about the lead character's life as a lawyer and a person as it is about gamma irradiated subplots and bad CGI fight sequences. And let's just get that out of the way. The CGI is not great. It's not terrible, but it's not great. And the fact that she Hulk succeeds, even despite that is pretty impressive. The vast majority of that success can be laid at the feet of Tatiana Maslany, who absolutely crushed this role. It's not a surprise for anyone familiar with her work, especially on Black Orphan. Was it Black Orphan? Black. Orphan, Orphan Black. Orphan Black. Black. Thank you. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> <That's a single laughs> Thank you. But bringing to life, as soon as I read it, I was like, that's not right. That's not right. <laughs> but bringing to life both exceedingly ordinary Jen Walters and towering emerald icon She-Hulk is not an easy job, especially because she had to break through, through the fourth wall constantly in a way that was not only believable, but also not overly precious. She did great comedic work in every episode of this show 
show, and I do hope she gets a nomination for it. Uh, credit also needs to be given to showrunner Jessica Gao, who gave us nine episodes. They allegedly lost one mid-filming due to budget and scheduling issues, and the show even acknowledges this on screen. But creating such an engaging, warm, and delightful set of situations for our hero, as well as memorable supporting characters. I do feel bad for Josh Shigora, who gets lost in the shuffle as Pug, but Ginger Gonzaga as Jen's awesome assistant is amazing. Tim Roth totally rehabs his abomination from the panned Incredible Hulk film, and Patty Guggenheim as the instantly iconic Madison. And those are just a few of the standouts. It's, if you're, if you find comics fair, self-serious, and it makes you roll your eyes. She-Hulk is a completely different monster. It's a blast. If anything, I wish the episodes were longer. And again, that season ending, you cannot say that the show was not ambitious. So um, it's a comic show. It's silly, but I just, I loved every single episode of it. Uh, Dustin, I think you woohooed when I mentioned it. Oh, yeah. I love it. I love stuff. that just I love when you make fun of properties and I, I just love that kind of like meta look at things. And it's like like with Deadpool where Deadpool talks to the audience and knows he's in a movie or if you read the comic, you know, he's in a comic book. Same thing with She-Hulk, in which I would love to see them team up, actually, to see who's going to take over, mm. who gets to talk to the audience. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that'd be kind of fun. But I, I love it. I, I, I want more. I want another season of it. I would love to see, apparently, at some point in the comics, Howard the Duck works for She-Hulk as a PI. Yes. Um, I want to see some of that. I want to see, you know, just more goofy. I want to see more hookups with Daredevil. I would yes. love that. Yes. And um, maybe she could show up on the new Daredevil show. That'd be awesome. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. And one of the things I, I had read some criticism about the Marvel Universe maybe a year ago where they're just like, these are all incredibly hot people. Why are none of them having sex? And like She Hulk is a show that is like aggressively pro sex. And it is mm -hmm. pro like, I am a woman and I am a very hot woman. And if I want to go on hookup apps and hook up, like I'm able to do so. So it was interesting to see pushback. I say interesting, but not at all interesting. And also again, not again, all, all surprising. So right. um, yeah, that's the world that we live in. Um, and the fact that they, they use that whole toxic masculinity angle throughout the whole thing, which was actually happening live while we were watching the show. Yeah. And it was also happening on the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It was kind of, a, the layers. It's a perfect. Yeah. It really was. It was a lot of um, yeah. fun layers to it. And I just thought it was a really well executed first season. Ama, did you watch it? I did. I, and again, I, I really like the Marvel properties that a don't take themselves seriously and B are conscious and playful about the medium that they're in. So like for this, uh, for a lot of the same reasons that I loved WandaVision as much as I did last year, mm -hmm. I liked she Hulk this year because it was just like, this is a legal comedy. Like we know what that type of show is. We're going to treat it as such. And it's going to have more emphasis on that than like fitting into like the larger Marvel narrative as it pertains to tone. It's very tonally different. And I appreciated that a lot. Um, I was also really sad that Josh Cigar kind of got like lost in the mix. Cause he's, so so fun on mm -hmm. the other two and i was so happy to see him and i was just like oh, yes and yeah i had i had a lot of a lot of fun with it and yeah it's it's it is really it it, el it elegantly captures the nightmare of dating in your 30s in a way that like oddly enough like this was the show that was like oh yeah that's it i didn't expect you to talk about it jen walters <laughs> but thank you for bringing that up um and yes, it is very concerned with like making sure that she's fucking. It's also concerned with from the pilot, like the idea that it's like, oh, Captain America is hot as he has never had sex. I don't believe you. And like, right. I appreciate that. Like from the jump, they're like, yeah, okay, we'll address it. Yes, he did. And <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it was really well done. Um, so thank you for all listening to me talk about comic books. I swear this is. I, can I swear that? I think it's the last time I'll talk about comic books this episode. <laughs> you don't. You don't have to promise that. You don't. I, you you don't know us that. Just we'll see true. what happens. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Kate, why don't you talk to us about your second pick? So speaking of thirsty, mm. um, my second pick is the bear. Uh, Ooh, <laughs> I don't remember selling my life rights. <laughs> <laughs> the, the gay community will get that joke. I, I feel like the no, I got are it. still get, not aware. Okay. Get she well, hope to get take it, it to court. Explain it to me, please. <laughs> are you being so, serious, Dustin? Oh, come on. 
Do you not know what a bear? Oh, come on. You're being terrible. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Go if on, I Kate. Told, if I had said the otter, that's a little more of a deeper cut. <laughs> yes, yeah. correct. The otter is a deeper but, cut. No. So, so the bear is another sort of like half hour dramedy. I think it was on FX. I watched it on Hulu. I watched mm-hmm. a lot of stuff on Hulu this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is about uh, Carmi Berzato, who is a uh, sort of refugee from the hot, the world of hot cuisine that's gotten burned out on. And he comes back to his his brother has died and he comes back to take over his brother's like Chicago uh, uh, sandwich shop and kind of like. It's about him coming back home and like being in this milieu and dealing with losing his brother and also the sort of like flaming out of this passion um, job that he had that was very toxic. And also, but it's also about the people who are in the shop to begin with, the community there. Incredible performances. Um, by uh, Eben Moss Backrack, who had an incredible year. He was also John Kerry U in The Dropout, and he is in Andor, which is a great show that I am in the middle of watching and might have put in my top three if I had finished it before now. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Ayo Edabiri is Sydney, who's like the young chef who comes in. Um, and it, it's just, it's a wonderful show about community, about place, about grief, about work, about food, and some of the most it like just exciting sensual kind of like food porny beautiful cinematography this i think it's the second to last episode that's like a real time episode yeah. of oh my god unbelievable episode where they have gotten a good review and they they have not set up their ordering system correctly so they are not prepared to receive all of the orders that they get and it's the episode is them dealing with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of orders in real time trying to like it's it's a wonderful show um i think it's back for another season if it did if it wasn't you know another season it still would have been a great episode of television i feel like i've had this conversation multiple times with my boyfriend he's like that was such a great show also great music drops great great needle drops throughout too really excellent um radio head drop in the end that like made me cry just like so beautiful um in another time and place this would have been an extraordinary indie movie but instead it's like four hours of television right and and i i think it used those four hours of television beautifully i had a wonderful time watching it the bear Delia, you've seen this, right? Yes, I have. I also loved The Bear, and it is one of the shows that I really want to go back and watch a second time. Yes, because it really it yeah. benefits It goes from so one. quickly, and everything is happening mm-hmm. really, really fast. And definitely chop, chop, in that chop, chop, penultimate chop, chop, chop. episode um, that is in real time, but throughout, like, I remember describing it, like, I saw it in two chunks, and I was like, it gives me so much anxiety, but it's also really, really good. Um, yeah. I love what you said about how, yes, this would have been a phenomenal indie film, uh, you know, that would have like done great at Tribeca, um, right. yeah. five mm-hmm. years ago, but it's so yeah. much more fun to actually get to live inside it for longer. This is a show, the show that more than any other I've recommended to men this year, um, because I'm like, you need to watch this and think about your feelings and maybe <laughs> let yourself feel some feelings and maybe explore yep. therapy. Um, yep. and, and in the meantime, don't dose a whole bunch of kids <laughs> with fake ecto-cooler. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you do, you know what? It's it's, okay. it's all right. It's maybe better that way. They can all just be yeah. shh, quiet. Um, <laughs> no, it's phenomenal. And because this is a safe space, I can say that I actually used the line, have you watched the bear? as my opening line on Bumble for like yes! five months this year. Yes! <laughs> and have the responses it's been good. Order or? <laughs> it's been really good. It's very successful. It works super, super well. I appreciate the men who take the time to Google the words, the bear, and then <laughs> say to me, no, but it looks cool. Not the men that say, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> Have you done A-B testing and seen how it goes with you? Uh, this is me if you watch Dahmer. Like what no, the different response is. Great right? question. Yeah. Well, no, because I haven't watched Dahmer. So. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah, no. I'm just um, guessing no, that would be a completely amazing. different group. And then on a personal note, I really love the aspect of the bear that is about what happens when you do go and fulfill your dream and realize that mm-hmm. that dream is bad for you. And then yes. you have to reconcile with the fallout of like, I 
Like, what's my new dream now? Do I still yes. want yeah. this thing that I've wanted for so long that like mm-hmm. took over my personality when I've realized that it's like highly damaging? It's yeah. just, oh, it's, it's so I, layered. It's so beautiful. But yep. oh, more than anything, I think every man should watch the bear and talk to another man about how it made him feel. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the last part of that sentence I think is so important because yes. it, it is it is the type of show where like it asks the men in it to like well it asks the men in it really to like think about who they are and what they want, why they are the way they are. Um and I think that that is always a good thing. But I think it is very important then for men to not talk to like their women friends and be like, let me tell you all the feelings I had about this. Let me stop you right there. I don't <laughs> want that. <laughs> Um, but yes, I do, I do think that like, there's, there's so much tied up in that. And I do think that it's definitely a show that like more men should watch and then talk to each other about how it makes them feel. But gosh, I, I believe if I'm remembering the timeline correctly, the bear was a COVID watch for me because I had nowhere to be and all this time to catch up on TV. Uh, Um, and even then, like, I didn't want to rush through it, but I also like could not stop myself because I needed to know where it was going. Yep. And it's so propulsive. Like it, it is. Just, it's a piece of filmmaking. It's incredible. It's, it is. It's propulsive. And more so than any other show, like Delhi, that thing that you said about like it made you anxious. Everybody I talked to said it felt that way. As someone who yeah. has high levels of generalized anxiety, I was very nervous to watch it because of that. Um, but I'm well medicated now and it was a good test. Um <laughs> I did I did I did great. Um but yeah, it was wonderful. And let me also speak up for Ao Adibari, who, um, like, the world is like, "Hey, have you known about her?" I was like, "Oh gosh, yes, she's wonderful." Like, she was in um, Dickinson. Yes, thank she's you. in the second season of Dickinson, yep. and she was one of my favorite parts. She's so good. And she's then so good. also uh, was a writer on Big Mouth, and then after Jenny Slate left the role of Missy, I actually got to do an article for the Interabang about who we thought should take over the role, and like. I like to be right. I wanted I I wanted Ayo Adebri to do it, and she got it. So like, anytime I can talk up that correct guess, I'll take yeah, it. Absolutely. But all, all this is to say, she's been wonderful for years, and I'm so excited that everybody's finding her now and being like, "Gosh, she's good. She is. She's okay. very good." And so anything good. else you could watch her. If you didn't watch Dickinson, watch it. She's. It's all wonderful, but she is great. Awesome. Awesome, Terrific. Awesome. Well, you guys have done an amazing job selling the bear. Um, I probably will have to watch that on my own. I don't need anything else that's going to give my partner anxiety. But thank you for that recommendation. <laughs> I will take it. Um, Delia, why don't you talk to us about your next pick? Thank you. So I am, I was just completely enthralled by Severance this year. Um, the sort of sci-fi psychological workplace thriller on Apple TV plus um, the big name that's attached to it is that Ben Stiller is an executive producer. He also directed a lot of the episodes. Um, the premise of severance is basically that this corporation um, that w- operates out of this very like future retro futuristic um, campus um, that they actually filmed at the old um, Bell Industries campus in, I believe it's New Jersey, um, a company called Lumen. You don't know what they do. You don't know what they make, but you know they're just this giant corporate conglomerate, um, has figured out a way to have the employees that choose this procedure um, basically sever their brain so that when you are at work, you have no idea who you are outside of um the office. And then once you get into the elevator, it clicks back so that you become your home life a person and you have no concept of who you are and what you do while you're at work. Um, it is obviously very, very satirical and very um, skewering of you know corporate work culture, um, which for anybody who has worked in that environment, we're all fully aware of how absolutely absurd it can be. Um, but as a thriller, it's also just so riveting. It's so original. I found myself week to week just, I mean, it would come out on Fridays on Apple TV and sometimes like 
at midnight, I would be like, I need to watch it. And it is the type of show that if you want to go down 1000 Reddit conspiracy threads <laughs> and see what everybody thinks and what everybody says and put those things together. It was the only episode this year that I would listen to two and three hour um, podcasts about because there's just so much there. And as the season unfolds, you learn more and more and more and you get even deeper into the mystery um, to the point that I was in Denver for a wedding when the finale dropped and I literally watched it on my laptop at 3 a.m. in the dark with headphones on because I didn't want to wake up my friend <laughs> <laughs> and just like gasped silently. It's just like a phenomenal thriller. It's so well done. It's very smart. And we will be getting a second season. And also just to say, Adam Scott, it plays the lead in this movie. And it's amazing to see him bring together um, sort of his like, very over it, um, bereft character from Party Down with his sort of like sweet, sweetie pie Ben Wyatt from Parks and Rec. And now uh -huh. sort of play this man who unwittingly finds himself in like a very sinister corporate conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Is anyone else watched it? Cause I know it is easily one of the most well-reviewed shows of the year. I just, I don't have Apple TV. That's one of mm. my kind of crosses to bear. It's the one thing I don't have. Um, did anybody else watch it? I, I did. haven't. It's on my list. You did or did not Alma? I did. And what did you think? I loved it. This was one, my sister and I tend to diverge in some paths on like where we watch TV, but anytime there's something that she's like, you cannot miss this, she will let me know. And Severance is one of, I want to say two things on this year's list that fell under that. She had watched it in real time as you did, Delia, and it took me a little while to get to it. And I think that was another one of my pandemic watch, or uh, COVID watches actually. And it's stellar. It's beautifully made, um, like beautifully shot really smartly written um like continually fascinating in like a not contrived way like sometimes you'll think people will be like oh i didn't really see something coming i'm like mm -mm, well but this like <laughs> truly remained mysterious remained thrilling and like there's still so many even at the end of the first season there's still so many like unanswered things that like they're well founded to go into a season two that's still as captivating where you're not like the mystery and the thrill is not gone hmm and yeah. there's still more to mine yeah. there. I've heard only amazing things. It's one of those things where I was like, I'm almost to the point of getting Apple TV. Like I'm always just about there. And this there's is definitely... so much good stuff. Here's, like Dickinson. It would, here's it would be well worth worth your investment to do so. Hundred yeah, percent. Even if it's just the seven day free trial to only watch Severance, I will say there is a clear <laughs> love story between yes. Christopher Walken and John Turturro. And mm -hmm. it is I mean, I know I just spent quite a long time discussing how delightful Starstruck is. The romance between these two men rivals how delightful Starstruck is. It like they could have their own rom com, and that would also be phenomenal. It is just so incredible. It, it is. It's a really lovely side, and like again, like I could see, like in your brain, just like Christopher Walken and John Turturro. Like I could see that that's what your brain is doing. And I, I, I assure, way, way to I assure on the game you, in, people. I assure you, it works. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I'm envisioning, I'm envisioning Christopher Walken as Captain Hook from Peter Pan Live. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> And I'm just like, well, that is incredible. That's what I'm. That's where I am right now. It's okay, so speaking speaking of Severance headcanon, another thing that I feel it's very important for me to say, and I just came from this today. So a friend of mine does a sketch show where we write sketches about like the news in 2022 and like try to try to like position it within like the course of pop culture and all these other things that happened. And one sketch that we unfortunately did not get to stage because one of the main actresses in it got sick was a Severance spoof of like what would happen. Essentially, the premise that I put forth, and to an extent probably believe, let's be honest, is that Tom Brady has been severed, <laughs> but he's stuck in work Brady. <laughs> like, something has happened, and, like, you can't go back to, like, regular home Tom Brady, and that's the reason that his marriage has fallen apart. So if you see a sketch to that effect sometime before season two debuts, like online, you're welcome. 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> Delightful. So I love well, that, Ama, because for as much as I was into the show, it never occurred to me that some real life people might already be severed. Be but separated. now that you like, have what's going on with Tom Brady? Tom Brady has been separate. Unleash <laughs> this. Like you want a conspiracy theory? Possibility. I, I mean, it's it's endless. I can't wait to see who else I think has been severed. And that's something we can come back to for best of 2023. <laughs> as, but as a true crime feature, I think. Yeah. Yes. Um, or like a docu a docudrama made yes, of that. Absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> the the serpent is eating its tail. Dustin, why don't you talk to us about your second pick? Okay, my second pick uh, is from NBC slash Peacock, and it's the new Quantum Leap. I Tell grew me about up with, this. Yes. Tell me about this. You haven't. You don't know anything about this. Okay. No, I, no, I know it exists, but I, I also loved the original. Yeah, I grew up with Quantum. I I started watching Quantum Leap. I think it was back in the day when they still had summer reruns, and I was I was a, I was a tween at some of some point, and um and they had quantum leap week so they had like two or three episodes a night for a full week it was during the summer and i was staying at my grandmother's so i'd watch it every night i got into this show and as anybody who doesn't know quantum leap is about uh the original is about um sam beckett dr sam beckett played by scott bacula and he goes back in time into this leap machine and he jumps into other people's bodies and tries to fix mistakes that happen in their life to make their life go the right way or whatever put put, put right, right what, what once wrong. went wrong yes, hoping exactly that each time his next leap would be the would leap, be the home. leap home. <laughs> <laughs> and uh the only contact we ever see for him that's back in this lab or whatever um is um the late dean stockwell who played al and he comes in as a hologram and guides him through each leap and tells him what he has to do and who he, whose body he's in and all that stuff so in the new one um, they've been working on the Quantum Leap program, like rebooting it, but they've, it's been shut down ever since Scott Bakula's uh, Sam Beckett never came back. Is it Beckett or Bennett? Now I'm not starting Beckett. to remember. It's okay. Beckett. It's Sam Beckett. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know why. Anyway, so he never came back, and that's how it ends the original Quantum Leap. He never found his way home. That was the last line because they just got canceled out of nowhere. So they bring this back, and they had been working on it. They've been kind of reluctant because of all the bad things that happened before, but, you know, they're all saying we've got it. We've got a better hold of everything and whatnot. And for some reason, um, Dr. Ben Song, who was supposed to be the hologram guide, ends up going jumping into the leap machine, and they have no idea why. So in this version, he's leaping from place to place and you know taking over different people's bodies and correcting things. But his fiance, who uh, Addison, is played by Caitlin Bassett, um, she ends up becoming the hologram. She was supposed to be the leaper. And she ends up becoming the hologram and they're trying to, and he can't remember a thing that's going on. So each episode, they're trying to get it out of him. Like, why did he jump into the leap machine? What is he up to? It looks like there's a pattern going on. You're seeing stuff that's taking place at headquarters at the same time. And they're trying to figure out what's going on because he's been working with somebody and it looks like it's Al's daughter who's been trying to take over the leap program from a, a location they don't know about. And it's really good. Um, they have a good like gender queer character, which I think is not, you don't see as often you'll either see a trans person or you know somebody but this person is you don't know you know like non-binary most likely and that's not usually somebody you would see in especially uh broadcast tv on mm -hmm. a popular show like this mm -hmm. and um it, it's a really great character and ernie hudson is the team leader um ah! yeah he's he's in it Perfect. which yeah, you gotta love ernie hudson Give and it's flowers. a good show it takes a couple episodes to really kind of pick up and get you involved and yeah, understand do, what's yeah. going on and all the characters but i really really like it um it's on break right now it only had eight episodes so far but they're taking a break and it's coming back in january for more and um i i really really recommend it oh the, the guy who plays dr ben song is raymond lee and he's been in a lot of stuff um i can't remember everything he's one of those faces that you know but you've seen in something else and I'm like, I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head, but he's also got that, that cute, you know, um, quality to him. That's kind of like, uh, Oh my gosh. Um, dude from, uh, who was just in blockbuster and he was also in WandaVision. Oh, uh, Randall, Rand Park. Randall Park. Randall, Randall Park. Park. Yeah. He's, I don't know why he has that kind of quality to him. He to does. Him. They're kind of similar. Every man kind of quality to mm -hmm. him. Yeah. And you're just like, Oh, you're so cute. <laughs> so, but yeah, I recommend the new quantum leap. I think it's great. Great. Has anyone watched it? Uh, like, I love that you nominated something from actual broadcast television, which actually did have a good year doing mm -hmm. that. And I know it was on your larger list, Abbott Elementary. I don't think it made your top three, yes. right, Ama? Uh, yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, it didn't make my top three this year, but 
it's undeniable how incredible it's been. Yeah, I don't think it really needs to be. It's it's yeah. it's, it's, it's already up the top anyway. It's, so. it's, it's an under it's an understood. Yeah, list topper. Excellent. Exactly. Yeah, which is why I love that you've got something that's not quite like everyone's talking about. I'd rather do like a whole episode of those as opposed to, oh my god, have you heard about this show that everybody's talking about? So mm-hmm. thank you. It was a, a great pick, Dustin. Thank you. Um, with that being said, let's go ahead and take another quick break, and we'll be right back for our final round of picks for our favorite TV series of the year. And we are back with the last round of our best of 2022 TV episode. Before we wrap things up, I want to ask my panelists, where can people find you on social media? And also, were there any uh, near misses that didn't make your top three? Some honorable mentions that you'd like to talk about briefly. Ama, let's start with you. So I am on Instagram and on Hive Social in lieu of the rapidly dying Twitter, at Ama Marfo. First, last name, no spaces. And as far as honorable mentions, I want to make sure there's space to talk about Our Flag Means Death, uh, starring Reese Darby and Taika Waititi on HBO. It was a show that I think is a real interesting Trojan horse of what it's about. When you go in at the beginning, it's about these pirates on a ship, and it's kind of a workplace comedy in the sense that Reese Darby kind of almost comes in uh, as Steed Bonnet, this guy that just like, wants to give the pirates on his ship a satisfying work life. And they're like, what? (laughs) Like, there's a point where they get off and, like, go on an island because he's like, I think you should be able to have a holiday. And they're struggling with the idea of what that is. And then partway through, it turns into this lovely queer pirate love story. The character of Blackbeard, not to be confused with the actual Blackbeard, Taika Waititi, cannot stress this enough, not interested in the actual history of Blackbeard. (laughs) So he arrives... And this love story forms between him and Steed and the other uh, characters kind of start to pick up on it. See, you get to see how the relationship develops, how other people deal with it. And it was just such a lovely surprise about what it ended up actually being. And the cameos are fantastic. Will Forte shows up, Nick Kroll shows up, Tristan Shaw shows up. Um, the, uh, the collective cast, the ensemble is like really lovely and working together. A lot of really progressive stuff based on the time that it's in about gender and sexuality, but it's so funny, so lovely, and just like a really good feeling by the time that you finish it. So if you have heard tale of it, it is as good as you're hearing, possibly better. And if you haven't heard of it, I'm telling you now, make time for it. It's excellent. It was one of the sweetest shows I have watched all year, and I was not expecting that in any way, shape, or form. It was mm-hmm. just darling. So, uh, and also brutal at the end. Like it was absolutely yeah. like soul crushingly brutal, but not in a way that's like going to upset you. It's just like, oh no. But anyway, I don't want to spoil anything. Not in a barrier your gaze way. I also want to say that. Yes. It is you. not that. Thank you. That's a great uh, uh, point to make. Delia, how can people find you? And tell us a little bit about your other projects. Yes, absolutely. So you can find me on Instagram where I'm at Delia Approved 1A. Um, And my other projects are the return of the Waste of Time newsletter and um, some writing that I will be doing in the new year as well, which I will absolutely hype on Instagram. Um. I actually have a list of some notable mentions um, that I loved this year. Um, There's Chloe, which you can watch on Prime. It's a British um, show. Cleo on Netflix, which is a German show. Yellow Jackets on Showtime, which if you haven't heard of, talk to anyone about it. It is phenomenal and will be coming back soon. Um, I loved the Netflix um, reboot of the Australian teen drama Heartbreak High. Absolutely fantastic. Um, And the two NBC sitcoms, Grand Crew and American Auto. Um, I think those are all really great, fun shows. Um, Some less fun than others, depending on the subject matter. But if you haven't seen any of them, do check them out. They are all great in their own special ways. Thank you for bringing up American Auto. They're TV commercial episode was one of the best things I saw all year. (laughs) I tell people who work in that sort of PR environment to watch it. And I'm like, it might be triggering, but it's worth it. (laughs) It's incredible. Like that episode alone, I was just like, 
the second like in the in the moment watching it in real time i was like this is gonna be one of the best things i see all year and the whole show is that but my god yeah. so good um, excellent for well, anyone who doesn't know it's about the c-suite um of uh an automobile company and just a very workplace cast of characters type of of sitcom anna gasteyer plays the ceo it's just really amazing love anna gasteyer and i was thrilled is it coming back do we know i believe so yes Excellent. Good news to hear. Uh, Dustin, can you tell us a little bit about how people can follow you and uh, your other projects? Yeah, um, you can find me on Instagram at either Dustin Can Read or at the Rewatch Recap. And I'm on TikTok at Dustin underscore Holden. And yeah, I have two podcasts. One of them is the most active right now, and that's the Rewatch Recap, where I uh, watch a, a season of a TV show and recap every episode. Um, currently, we're on my so-called life. We're in the middle of that, so we're, we're yeah, we're, we're halfway through that almost. And um, we actually have everything recorded. It'll go through like the end of February. And before that, we did the first season of Scream, the TV series, which was fun mm. to do. Um, we make fun of it. We we question things. We put in little life notes in the middle of it of stuff that's happened to us or anything like that. It's fun to do. And my other show is Dustin Can Read and Watch, where I'll some, I, I'm kind of uh, lagged off on that a little bit. But usually about once a month, I have a new episode come out. And it's just uh, either YA or middle grade books that I've read. And we'll recap those or I'll give reviews on those. Or current TV shows, like, you know, in a way, kind of like this, where we talk about usually a full season of a show but not I, like recapping every little bit of it just kind of talking about it overall um i, I love like tv obviously but <laughs> i can't watch everything too much is out now it's, it's just too much so, so like well you know since we didn't get to get everything in in this episode like i'm glad you said you know what was our next in line um and a couple of those have already been mentioned like grand crew and uh i i love a lot of other things like the cleaning lady on fox Love that show. Um, Miss Marvel on Disney Plus. Uh, there's a great uh, reality game show called Claim to Fame, which was just so trashy and fun. It was just like celebrities, relatives, and you had to guess who was related to who. And that was, it was really fun. And, you know, um, also some returning stuff like uh, the new Gossip Girl. Love it. I love uh, the sex lives of teenagers. And uh, I know there was another one that came out, but can't think of it right what? this moment. Do but, you mean uh, sex lies of college girls? Oh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Freudian no, slip, that's, that's um, fine. Again, I didn't remember selling my life rights. And so, like yes. <laughs> <laughs> As Kate can attest, that is completely false. <laughs> no life. <laughs> I love that. Take, no take a drink, you two. Take a drink. Is that the show, though? That that basically. It, it's essentially like it, it's like living in Amish country, but without actually the, the, the cachet of being Amish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the sex life of college girls, Dustin. That's what you're saying. Yes, it's, that's what that's what I meant. But that's yeah, okay. I love that show. So, and that just came back. For I haven't mm. caught up on it yet, but I'm getting really excited to, to watch it pretty soon. It's so. great so far. It is great so far. Okay, good. Can confirm. Excellent. Thank you, Dustin. And again, I very much appreciate both you and Delia guesting with us this week. Please go check them out on all of their endeavors. Kate, how can people find you? And what are some of your um, well, a projects and b some of your uh, other picks. Uh, so I am on Instagram as my cat at Gomez Rack. So there are a lot of cat pictures there. I mean, I guess I'm still on the hell site for now at Kate Reculia, uh, but hardly ever. Um, so yeah, some of my projects and stuff, I am working on writing a book. I have not finished it yet, but my most recent book came out in 20 Mooney Talks to Ghosts. Uh, it's out there in the world. Please enjoy. Uh, and, um, my, I have two sort of like, uh, honorable mentions one uh the delia mentioned yellow jackets which it feels like it came out 10 years ago but in fact it, it finished in january of this year of our lord 2022 um but that show more than any other show this year honestly has that feeling of being made ex exactly for me the the girls are exactly my age and the needle drop speaking of uh, in the in the mid '90s section, feels an attack. <laughs> but it's that it was such a such a great showcase for 
um, some terrific young actors, some terrific older actors who I have loved for a long time. Hail Melanie Linsky. Um, and I, it was the first season really pulled it off. And I hope that the second season, which is coming back soon and includes Elijah Wood. Fantastic. Yep. I don't even know what's going to happen, but I think he's hanging out with Christina Ricci. I didn't and I know just, that. Yes. This oh is what happens God. when our generation makes television. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that and, um, you know, I do still watch the Bake Off. It was not a great season no. this year. I have a lot of qualms with the ways that they are positioning things, and it's yeah. not just Mexico Week. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, I, I do have I, I have some questions for you about that. Well, I'll, I'll ask off air, but okay. I do have some because okay. I think in some in some elements I did really like it. Like I think they returned to showstoppers that were not architectural challenges, and I appreciated yes. that. I was like, yes. you could just bake and not bake and build. Awesome. Yes. Loved that yeah. about the season. But yes, there are other areas where yeah. I have problems. Yeah, we'll we'll get into that later. Uh, but if you are looking for soothing Bake Off vibes that are not Bake Off, have you tried the Great Pottery Throwdown, I ask you? <laughs> it is. And the, the season this year was great. It was this year, I think. Yeah, it yeah, was. I think I watched the season this year. They blend together. And it is just, you know, you have the cheeky entendres about pulling handles <laughs> like you have your soggy bottoms. <laughs> and the uh, the host now is uh, Siobhan from um, Dairy Girls. Dairy Girls. <gasps> oh, love her. Uh, yes. And she is fantastic. And it's a lovely hug of a show that I always makes me happy tears oh. every episode. Happy tears. Yeah, every episode to interject there. I meant to add in the doghouse UK. I don't know if you've ever watched that. It's on HBO oh. Max. It's about pairing people with dogs and the stories that go along with it. And it is one of those happy cry ones that'll just make you feel good about yourself. And oh, it's God. had three seasons so far. So, Oh my God, really? The Doghouse UK. Oh my God. It's like basically The Bachelor, but with dogs. So like everybody kind ends of. up actually with like, that's amazing. Wow. It's that's mainly adorable. like two or three stories. And it's people who come to this, like this nice place that has a bunch of animal, mainly dogs and cats, but they focus on the dogs and they pair them with people based on their personalities and their preferences and whatnot. So. Couples that last, I have to assume. Exactly. Yes. For the most part, yes. I have higher hopes for their love than, <laughs> than that of the Bachelor the Industrial and Happened afterwards and stuff. So. Oh my god. Well, amazing. Thank you for that. Um, so before I forget, because I did have a list, and then of course I forgot to write them down. My um my honorable mentions, uh, a couple that are currently airing as we watch right now. I'm loving Welcome to Chippendales on Hulu. Oh, yes, I really. I've been meaning to I watch really that. Loved the um the podcast oh, oh I, haven't, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't i haven't listened to the podcast but it's the it's called welcome to your fantasy oh it's okay <laughs> so it's uh, ostensibly the story of like the founding of the chippendales club camille nonjani plays the founder um oh god what is her name um she's broadway Anna, actress annalee ashford thank you annalee ashford is so charming as his accountant slash wife. Like as soon as she's on the screen, I'm just like, oh my God, I want to just hug you. Um, she's she's terrific. And um, who else is in that? Uh, Murray Bartlett having a hell of a year. And um, of course, Juliette Lewis uh as just like an agent of chaos in the show. But it's got everything. It is slutty, it, the music is spectacular. I've already gotten like five disco tracks I'd never heard off of this show, and I was like, yes, mama, yes um it's it's engaging the first episode really ends on a shocker but i've it's i think there's three or maybe four episodes out right now i'm loving every minute of it also loving every minute of white lotus season two oh on hbo gosh. which I, like i i didn't watch season one until after the emmys where it was just like everything was white lotus and so i'm watching season one i was like it's cute like it, it and it does it gets so much better like it unfolds much like a flower and when you understand what it's actually about it's actually very compelling but for the first three episodes i was like they be winning a lot of awards for this shit <laughs> and then like but then like you get it you're like oh no okay yes no no i understand i feel like season two out of the gate has been just like killing it from the start and um I, i'm i'm loving aubrey plaza is just the acting she does with her eyes and her face in that show sends me so um really really good on that and then um a little bit later uh, or earlier this year and kate might disagree with me on this one but the lord of ring lord of the rings rings of oh. power show <laughs> she and i watched the first episode together drink, drink. 
Um, <laughs> and we both nearly fell asleep because it yeah. was not terrific. It was no. a slog. It felt yeah. impenetrable. Um, in, in yeah, the, my apartment smelled of meat. Yeah, I remember that. If there's yes. a word that I didn't want to hear on a Saturday out. night, it's impenetrable. <laughs> but like, it just it wasn't. <laughs> it was not giving, even though it looked great. It was not terrific, but the up uh, the episodes get going and by like five or six it feels like a full-blown feature film there is jaw-dropping stuff that happens about two-thirds of the way through that season that i was like holy shit this is up there with the actual original lord of the rings trilogy in terms of storytelling and filmmaking it was very compelling so slow start but it really does crest nicely falls off a little bit towards the end but i did want to give it some flowers because it kind of got banged up a lot people really were gunning for that in the press and i get why um for multiple reasons but it was not as bad as everyone will, will have you say so um in terms of how you can find me uh you can find at eric resniak on all of the things uh and make sure you're following at culture underscore debate on twitter for now uh we will be getting off of that eventually at great pop culture debate on instagram and at gpcd on mastodom and hive as we'll slowly be migrating our activity to those channels which are not currently run by evil billionaire douchebags so with that out of the way let's get to these final picks i'm going to start round three with ama so i'm really glad that grand crew came up in a couple people's honorable mentions because i do think that we're coming back to the era of black people hanging out shows. I think we had a great era of it in the 90s. We lost it for a little bit. And then Insecure in Atlanta kind of brought it back. And now we have Grand Crew as well. And one that I wanted to make sure of it got some airtime is Bust Down on Peacock. So this is one that I have a little bit of a connection to by virtue of being in Boston. Two of the comedians that are in it, Sam Jay, who now writes for SNL, and Langston Kerman, who's based in LA, but writes for Southside and Sherman Showcase. They're two of the four main uh, cast members in it, alongside Chris Redd, who was also on SNL up until this current season. And then Jack Knight, who is was, was and we'll get to that in a moment, and LA-based comedian as well. And it's really just about them working at a casino in Indiana and just like the shenanigans that they get into. So there's an episode where about like they go to a barbecue and like the most light skinned of the four is like the guy that they're all making fun of and how he deals with those jokes. Um, there's one about um, like a co a former coworker of theirs who ends up being unhoused and how they kind of think about what it would be like if they went through that. But it's just like, people hanging out and having a lot of fun and they spent years working on it. And it finally came out on Peacock in April. Uh, it's, unfortunately just going to be the one season and kind of was the case, but it's kind of like dampened in enthusiasm because I want to say in September earlier this year, uh, Jack Knight uh, committed suicide Oh my god! and it, it was awful because he, like everybody that you would talk to who knew him and got to work with him was like, he was so lovely, really, really kind, really nice, incredibly smart and sharp. I remember the one time I got to see him live, I was at a house show in LA and it was right after just for laughs. And there was this, so for those who don't know, I'm also a comedian and there was just like all this drama over something that had happened at the festival with a comedian that was on like a showcase and a bunch of other people that I sort of knew were new people who were related to just like weren't going to talk about it. And Jack's like, fuck it. I just came back from Just for Laughs. Some shit went down and was <laughs> not afraid to talk about it. And he was just like electric to watch perform and like watching him on Bust Out. Like the last episode, like his arc in that episode is like, one of the best, like I was watching it and was like, this is going to be the, one of the best things I see all year. And I was so excited to be able to like, frankly, come here. I knew I was going to talk about it on this show. And to know that like, we can't get more of it because he's not here anymore is awful. Like, it's just watching people that like we know and like knew in common, just kind of like process that and realize just like, not just this character on this TV show is gone, but my friend's gone. It's awful. But please go back and watch it i want to say it's either eight episodes or ten episodes it's it's all around really funny but like especially knowing that like jack was as good as he was and we won't get any more it's it's a sad one but gosh he was great and so 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 great what did you say it was on again was it peacock peacock yeah peacock okay. great Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I had not ha heard of it. I'm so sorry, Alma. Um, really, I am for your. I, I didn't know him well, and I don't want to like claim it unduly, but like the community of which I'm kind of tangentially a part, it hit so hard. 
Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm so glad that you're able to bring it some attention through this. So thank you very much for putting it out there. Has anybody else happened to watch it? I've heard of it, but I haven't watched it yet. I just got, like signed up for Peacock, like real Peacock. And it's good. There's good stuff on there. There is good stuff on there. Yeah. Excellent. In addition to Columbo and Murder, She Wrote, which like I just required. <laughs> I, I just I did just restart. I did just restart Murder, She Wrote from the beginning. I'm very excited. Oh, I'm going to Maine so in a good. couple of weeks. And I'm like, I have yes! to do comedy. I'm like, I have material. I just kind of want to talk to you guys about Murder, She Wrote. Absolutely. Yes! Incredible. <laughs> Let's just talk about how Jessica Fletcher was clearly the serial killer all along. Like, there's along. no other yeah, possible explanation. Yeah, like, how much murder are y'all seeing? Because she saw so much murder. Yeah. So much murder <laughs> in that tiny town. Oh, my God. And then every time she traveled somewhere, someone would get, get killed. At what point does, like, the poli- do the police, like, as a national body, just be like, make this woman stay home? Exactly. Like, she was on yes. the watch list. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you for oh. that. Um I will go to my second pick, or excuse me, third pick, which is House of the Dragon on HBO Max. As one of the last remaining Game of Thrones apologists, and I will even defend the <laughs> series finale while acknowledging that the last season was brutally rushed. I came to this prequel with quite a bit of trepidation. It was inevitably going to get compared to Thrones arguably our last great water cooler show. And given the fairly scant source material that House of the Dragons is based on and the curdling the DOT fandom experienced after the last season of that show, could it possibly succeed? And bear in mind, HBO had already dumped millions and then torched another Thrones prequel that never went beyond the pilot. So it could possibly actually fail, which is... uh, for weird reasons, that kind of concerned me. And I wasn't sold after the first episode of House of Dragons. I honestly wasn't. It was fine. I was intrigued, but it lacked the punch that the cliffhanger of Thrones is pilot. And then whoosh, the show ignited. Every single episode got better and better, more and more dramatic, more gripping, more suspenseful, more tragic, more shocking. Literally each episode outdid the last. And I ended the season convinced that this was actually a better opening salvo than Game of Thrones ever had. And I think part of that is an issue of pacing. Whereas that first season of Game of Thrones followed the plot of book one from A Song of Ice and Fire, which was, let's just say, leisurely. We'll, we'll, we'll say leisurely. House of Dragons first season jumps nearly 20 years or more over the course of just 10 episodes. The show moves, but not in a way that feels hurried or at the expense of its character development. In fact, it does a masterful job of making us care for both of our primary antagonists, Rhaenyra, the presumptive heir to the Iron Throne, and Alicent, her former best friend turned bitter political rival. While many viewers compare Alicent to a certain brother-fucking queen from the original show, Dragon does a great job of explaining precisely why she is doing what she is doing here these aren't villains at least not between these two they're just victims of circumstance and they're still super compelling and actually what i realized halfway through watching the show is what made it so compelling for me wasn't the court intrigue or the battle sequences or you know the dragons flying everywhere and just blasting things to shit which is very satisfying it's actually a nighttime soap opera like Dynasty or Dallas. 100%. That is literally what this is. You love it's a nighttime too, soap. Yeah. It's you two do. powerful matriarchs trying to protect or enshrine their families. Whether in, I have the receipt. Exactly. I own 51% <laughs> of this kingdom. Oh. Um, and like... I, instead of Lily Pond fights and who shot JR, we have apocalyptic curses and ill tempered wyverns inciting civil war. Eat your heart out, Joan Collins. <laughs> That's what I have to say about that. So, lastly, even though it's a big budget fantasy epic, it's also home to some very strong acting. Both sets of actors who played Rhaenyra and Alicent are very good. Eve Best as Rainey's quietly steals every scene she plays in. Matt Smith is fully Matt Smithing as the brother slash uncle slash husband slash cousin you hate to have around but who brings the drama at every family barbecue. And Patty Constantine as King Viserys has to be a lock for at least an Emmy nomination for his performance in episode nine, which was genuinely moving at a level I was not expecting for a dumb show about make-believe royals slapping at each other with fire-breathing lizards. I was genuinely sad when House of Dragon ended this year, and I'm very eager for season two. So did anybody else watch it? Nobody else watched it. I did it not. Here. I'm the only no. one. I love this for me. Um, I've never it, been a Game of Thrones person. So. Is it also based on a book, or is it kind of like developed in in like in parallel to that? Canon? It's like short stories and stuff, right? So there is a. I actually have it. Um, it's part of uh, the 
world of ice and fire it's this giant compendium it's like huge it's a, it's a coffee table book and there's mm. like i don't know maybe 10 pages of like historical kind of apocrypha in the book that tell you I broadly see. what this war which is loosely based off of the war of the roses from actual english history was in this universe and it's essentially a family dynasty tearing itself apart over and I will say, like, the actual motivations and the way that they set it up in the show is really smart. Like, they're very – so there's not, like, the cookie-cutter bad guy. Like, there's always a reason someone is doing something. And, mm. like, it's genuinely compelling. Um, so the, there's, like, ten pages that they're taking this from, and they're turning it into, I'm going to guess, at least four or five seasons. So – Yeah. Okay. Delia, are we going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, Eric, you're now the second person I've heard um, describe it as a nighttime soap. And that alone is going to get me to eventually watch it. <laughs> Are you a nighttime soap fan, Delia? Love a nighttime soap. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have to be very honest with you. And same to you, Dustin. I want to do a separate podcast called The Spelling Bee, where we go back and revisit the spelling vision oh. shows. <laughs> oh, yeah. Melrose Place, uh, Beverly Hills 90210, Dynasty, like all of it. And like you can do charmed, you can do all those. All yeah. of it. Like this I, is my dream. I love this idea so much. Okay. So we have to find a way of making it because I have so much free time on my hands. Can we like, well, yeah, with all the free time we have. Yeah. Wait, can we like scoop in so notorious or whatever that was Absolutely. that sitcom that Tori Spelling was in? With what's herself? his face from um American Horror Story? Um Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Zachary Quinto was in yeah. that show. Yes. Oh, Before he was Siler on Her as Heroes. A baby. Yeah. Yes, he was this little baby gay and he was adorable um but anyway yeah it's, it's totally a nighttime soap and i am wondering what happens when the bro fandom that really kind of developed entire personalities around game of thrones realizes they're basically watching dynasty but with dragons don't right. tell them. nobody tell them. it's the same for people <laughs> yes, who watch right? yellowstone and think that that's just a drama no no, no it's a soap opera oh my god yes. yeah. Land, yeah. you know yeah yeah um but... so anyway Oh, sorry. I was going to say before I ever lived in America. So I was born in Romania. Uh, my oh. one of my first understandings of American culture was watching Dallas and nine hundred two one zero. So I'm there for the nighttime soap. <laughs> Amazing. She showed up to high school in America and was like, "I'm backstabbing every one of these bitches." <laughs> I will be head cheerleader. I choose myself. And that's the only <laughs> well, you didn't anyway, get reporting on time. Hmm, what a shame. Hmm. <laughs> but I do think uh, it, checking out House of Dragons. You don't need to know anything about Game of Thrones uh, if you have not watched it before. And it is it is juicy, honey. And there were some jaw dropping moments in season one. I was living. Uh, so check it out. With that being said, Kate, I'm going to turn it over to you for pick number three. So my final pick is a little show called Los Spookies, which uh, the second season came out this year. I also just watched the first season this year. It was just canceled by HBO. It was a weird little moon baby that was too pure and perfect to live. Um, it is a half hour comedy on HBO Max, uh, co-created by uh, Julio Torres, uh, Anna Fabrega, and... Um, Oh God, Fred, Ar Fred, Fred Armisen. Armisen. Yes, yeah. Um, and uh, Julio Torres was a writer for SNL. Uh, most famously, brought us Wells for Boys. So if you enjoy the the like very specific sense of humor about Wells for Boys, you would probably. <laughs> The the concept is, and when Fred Armisen, I think, was coming up with it, his main idea was, like, he went to Mexico City, and he's like, wow, there's a lot of goth kids here. There's, like, a huge goth culture in Mexico City. And he's like, what if instead of a bunch of kids, like, forming a band, they were, they were like, forming a group of people who would do, like, goth pranks on people? Mm -hmm. And it became Los Spookies. And the, the concept of the show is that it's a group of four friends who, like, have a business where they will do weird supernatural like they fake an exorcism for people like as like like a work um but it's really just a surreal comedy that's bilingual and very colorful and very queer and very sweet really um but i just wanted to read uh in the vulture article that describes los spookies being canceled i would like to read the description of it because i honestly don't think i could do any better than what jason p frank does uh the show followed Andres, the blue-haired heir to a chocolate throne. 
that was Julio Torres. Ursula, a reasonable les- lesbian who is incapable of being fucked with, Cassandra <laughs> Siangaretti. Rinaldo, the dutiful leader, Bernardo Velasco. And Tati, the many-headed, empty-headed enigma, uh, played by Anna Fabrega as they go into business doing ooky spooky odd jobs. Including, but not limited to, protecting the owner of a graveyard named Oliver Twix from local families angry he doesn't know where any of the bodies are buried. <laughs> and impersonating Shakira to inform the public that the untalented artist who created a Shakira sculpture did not do a bad job sculpting. (laughs) (laughs) It's so (laughs) these friends both occurred in one season two episode. It's true. It's just very strange and magical and lovely. And, and I wasn't super surprised to hear that it was canceled. Cause I was like, what is this unicorn of a show? But it is a very special show that I enjoyed a great deal. And there's two seasons. You'll watch it. You'll wish there were more, but you'll be glad that we have what we have. Oh, has anyone else watched? I've watched season one. I've been challenged into getting into season two, mostly because there, I have a dear friend who I watch it with and he's been yeah. like in the process of cross country travel. So like timing hasn't lined up to watch it, yep. but it is, it's such a special show. It's, it's so, so weird. Like weird. it's, it's a weird, <laughs> weird little thing. Like it's, it's one of those things where you just kind of like, I'm very sad that it's going, but it is nearly a miracle that it existed at all. Existed at all. Yes, yes exactly. Exactly. But it's, it's great. It's wonderful. And it's not, Delia, I'm like you, like, I don't like things that are like outright scary. It's a little bit spooky, but it's more funny than anything else because you see the background of it. So it's like, if you see how it's made, then it's not scary anymore. So like, you see enough of the background and like how hard it is for them to do it. (laughs) And like the weirdness of the people making it that the thing itself is no longer scary. Yeah, I yeah. saw and- about half of the first season and I only haven't gone back because it is a show that does require your full attention because yes. so much yes. of it is yeah. in Spanish and it is um, subtitled. And I do remember listening to the Pop Culture Happy Hour episode about it. And the guests on that episode talked about how it's also very specifically like they use this like Mexico City jargon. Um, so it's like very authentic to that. So even like, just um, your run of the mill Spanish speaker might not understand everything that's being said. That's being um, said. But, yeah. I, you know, hearing that Los Spookies was canceled really brought up, you know, that like old cliche of like nothing good can last. Um, mm-hmm. But I yes. do agree with what you both <laughs> said that like it is almost a miracle that it ever existed. And I'm so glad that it does. And I'm really excited to finish it. Stay yeah, golden, really, pony like, boy. That's what seriously. I have to say. <laughs> there's, seriously. There's like a, a random sequence in the second season, which like I don't, I I don't think this will spoil anything for either of you. Where like Andres is, is like he's rejected his his fortune and he gets a job a job modeling stairs. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the stair showroom where he just. Like, That's like, such a Julio thing. Torres yes! thing. Yes, like if you stairs. watched his special, it's it's very mm-hmm. concerned with like objects and finding objects. humor in things yeah. and. It's fantastic. Like he's he has such a specific he's, sense of humor, and it's so weird and so fun that like yep, that doesn't really spoil. I'm like, it doesn't spoil anything for me. I'm excited to no. see what that looks like. Yeah, like he's he's like modeling stairs, and then this like wealthy man comes up and is like, "I can take you away from." <laughs> <laughs> it's so great. Where is that wealthy man now? I will model stairs. Right? No, I'm just. Kidding. But but then he has children, and Andre and, and Andres is like. No, but no. I get that deal breaker. No, that's 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 fair. It's it's a great show. I feel like I need to watch it again because there it's there's so many layers and it's so colorful and weird and yeah, lots of spookies. Thank you, Kate. That is lovely, Delia. How about your third choice? So I'm going to round out my 2022 um, with Bad Sisters, the Sharon Horgan um, show on Apple TV Plus. Again, didn't realize that I would. Um, shill for apple tv as much as i have but you know they really did make some phenomenal phenomenal shows so bad sisters is a orig- is based on a, a belgian show um that sort of follows the same concept it's about five sisters um in sharon horgan's version they all live in dublin um they have been orphaned um they're now adults and each of them is sort of a little bit lost in her life in her own way but when the show begins, um, you find out that the 
only sister who, nope, not true. Uh, one of their sister's uh, husbands has died. Um, you know, the, the opening scene is literally at his funeral. Um, it's absolutely hilarious and deeply inappropriate in a specifically Sharon Morgan <laughs> way. Um, and so throughout the first uh, episode, you learn that the sisters have decided that because this husband was so awful, um, it goes back in time. I apologize. So it goes back in time. You realize that um, the, f- the four sisters are like, this husband um, is horrible. Uh, John Paul is his name. They call him the prick. I believe the pilot prick. episode is called the prick. <laughs> um, he's so mm-hmm. awful. And he's def- he's abusive, but in like a really subtle way. Um, and so they decide they need to kill him in order to free their sister and their niece of his um, just horribleness. And the so you know he's dead, but you have no idea exactly how it is that he died or if they succeed in killing him. Um, it's 10 episodes. It's, you know, like everything Sharon Horgan does, it's incredibly well written. It's full of heart. It's very smart. Um, it believes women. It, you know, there is trigger warning about domestic um, abuse. Um, but in the end, um, it it's not often that a show really like loves its characters beginning to end. And I just felt like I was in great hands the whole time. And then the way that it wrapped just could not have been more beautiful and more perfect. Um, I also really want to point out that it has really incredible performances from Anne-Marie Duff, who you might know from the original British version of Shameless. Um, Eve Hewson, who um, is technically a Nepo baby, as she is Bono's daughter, but she is just such a phenomenal yeah. actress in her own right. We have Brian Gleason, um, son of... Technically also a Nepo baby. Technically also a but Nepo But also baby. very talented in his own yeah, right. son of Brendan, uh, brother of Donald. Um, and there's also... Um, Daryl McCormick, who was in Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, who is just as charming and uh, truly cute as ever um, as one of the love interests here. It's just so, so good. It's so smart. And I just highly recommend it for anybody who has a woman or multiple women in their life that they love and cherish. I, I, again, Apple TV don't have it, but has anyone else watched? I have. That was... That was actually my project over the last couple of days because hearing how effusively you talked about it, Delia, my sister has been talking it up for me for months and especially like seeing the sisterly bond in it. Like I'm, I'm pleased now having watched it, like why she was so um, insistent that I watch it. It's beautifully done. Um, I, I am a big fan of Sharon Horgan. And in fact, it like my watching of it happened to coincide with me going to a reading at a live event with Rob Delaney, her writing partner on catastrophe. Um, So it was really nice to like have him and like his work in my mind. Like, as I also like watch this thing that she did after they worked together and yeah, it's so smart. And like, again, it starts with a murder and like ordinarily we're not encouraging murder, but like, as the show goes on, you're like, I too want to kill this man. Like he's, (laughs) awful if, and like not even murder just needs to be committed if ever a man needs to die it is in this case mm-hmm. and it will have you regularly saying kill the prick <laughs> yes it, it really does and like the further it goes on like the more people it possibly could have been like it's just like well shit everybody wants to kill this yeah. man so like he's He's awful, and yet it's not cartoonishly so. Like, it's it's very deeply ingrained, but it's also, like, not to the point of, like, oh, well, there's no way any person could do this. Like, it's believable, but also, like, oh, God, this is awful. And, yeah, by the time you get to the end and you do see, like, what the eventual resolution is, you're like, you feel good that a guy got murdered. Really like, do. you just do. I mean, it's such, um, like, Sharon Horgan's, I think, like, personal joke to create this series where, like, we really are all so happy that like they did a like someone did a murder. Um, and it is very much credit to the Danish actor Clay's Bang, who plays JP. Um, and he just is so good at being utterly vile. Oh. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. And and then again too, like 
the premise of kind of like figuring out who did it. So there's like a separate plot of like the company that is supposed to give out the life insurance policy and like they're investigating it. So we kind of like follow along with them of like, this doesn't look right. This is a murder that we don't think we should pay out. And you start to find out why that is. Um, so there's like a reason to kind of like go in and investigate it. And there's like a, a path that it takes the viewer through to understand why we're investigating this thing at all. So like, it's very elegantly put together and just, like you said, beautifully written, funny, really funny. Um, gosh, yeah, so much to love about the it. The title sequence is also absolutely incredible. It's so beautiful. It's a Rube Goldberg machine. Um, and it's one of those intros, similarly to the White Lotus intro that I watched every single time. Um, and for music fans, PJ Harvey was the music uh, consultant on this. And so like, it really does highlight a lot of beautiful like Irish um, singer songwriters, Irish musicians, it really makes me want to go to Dublin, um, and also buy one of those fantastic robe coats that Sharon Horgan wears. Yeah, every time they go like take a frigid swim in in the sea. <laughs> So yeah, like I, I just bought new coats and then I watched this and was like, do I need a new coat? Yeah. <laughs> like I might, but let me also say this, like 2022 in particular, really good year for opening sequences. Um, oh, yeah. cause like the, uh, bad sisters one is great. The severance one is excellent. White Lotus one is good. Like we're coming back to a point where we don't just blow past that part wow. of the show. And I'm, I'm happy to hear I that. I miss that. I miss like theme music. Yeah. I'm like a song or if it's music, it's just something. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, can the can good theme music be too far behind? Because I think we're reinvesting in that part of the experience. Yeah, I have Yellow Jackets. Yes, oh. Yellow Jackets is a great one, also. Great one. I have yep. never gotten over Survivor getting rid of the opening credit move, music and montage. They haven't had Rude. it for like 20 seasons, and it still stings me, still to this day. Speaking of Yellow Jackets. Mm. Anyway, thank you, Delia. That's a, a great pick. Appreciate that. We should definitely check that out. And Dustin, why don't you take us home with your final pick? Okay, uh, my final pick is also from Apple TV Plus. So it's a, it's a I'm kind of, we're kind of enticing you to, to join here. Apple TV here. Plus sponsor this podcast. That's what I have Apparently, to say. Apparently, <laughs> there we go. Plants. Yes, do that. Yes. <laughs> this one is called the the after party. Is the one I did, yes. and it's a it's a comedic murder mystery that takes place at the the. A, re, uh, a party after the high school reunion where a now famous ex-classmate uh, gets killed and suspects retell the events through the lens of different movie genres of each person in each episode. So it's, it's a really fun show because like you have Tiffany Haddish as like this detective. She really wants to prove herself, you know, as being this female detective and she can do the job. And, and so she's really kind of, <laughs> she's out there, of course, it's Tiffany Haddish. And, um, so the person that gets killed is uh, Dave Franco, and Dave Franco is this now you know pop icon named Xavier, and he is like uh, he, he was a, a music person and then turned into like a movie star kind of thing. It was like the in the Hungry Hungry Hippos movie. Um, <laughs> I forgot. That. Yeah, he was like, no, no, these these hippos aren't hungry. They're hungry, hungry. hungry. <laughs> and, yeah, it's really stupid. But you have him, and he he's found dead. That's where it starts off. It starts off. He's dead on the beach, off his like beach side home. It's on the cliff on the rocks. He fell all the way down from this cliff that he lives on. And um, there's all these people at this party, and you have like people like Sam Richardson, who was just in Hocus Pocus two. Um, you have Zoe Chow, who was actually with Sam Richardson in senior year with Rebel Wilson, that movie that came out. Um, you have Ike Barinholtz from The Mindy Project, Ben Schwartz from Parks and Rec and Sonic the Hedgehog, uh, Elena Glazer um, from Broad City. Mm -hmm. Is that Broad what you City, said? Yeah. Atlanta Broad or Alana? Alana. 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 Yeah. Okay. And Jamie Dimitru, who's like this British comedian who has been in a lot of stuff as like background characters, but he's just really cute, especially in this role. Um, he's just like this this classmate that got stepped on and never noticed and is there the whole time and sees everything. Um, but it's really fun because it starts off and you're getting like Sam Richardson's character. He does like that romantic comedy where it's all about what he wanted to happen at the reunion and how it all ended up here. And then it takes it to his ex-girlfriend's ex-husband, Ike Barinholtz, and he's doing an action you know he's an action star so he's like everything car chases and all that stuff is happening and then you have like Ilana Glazer she has a psychological thriller and <laughs> yeah you have all these different like genres like uh, Ben Schwartz has a musical like a you know 
Um, and it's all about what how they saw the situation and how she likes to talk to people. She goes, tell me about the movie version of what you, happened to your night. So that's how they, they do it. And so she has to figure it out based on, you know, their version of the events. It's pretty funny. And I was surprised that they're doing a season two. Yeah. But, wow. Yeah, they're I'm doing really a season surprised. two. They got picked up pretty quickly, actually, they are. after they finished out. It's going to be like uh, a like an anthology type thing. I, I think of it as like a funnier, well, we don't have to say funnier necessarily, but like a TV Knives Out where like Tiffany Haddish moves through, but it's a different story every time. Yeah. And oh, it also fun. has a great opening sequence. It's kind yes, of it like does. only murders in the building type. Yeah. 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 Way. yeah. It's really, I like it a lot. Great. Mm. I, and um, I, I guess you've watched it? I did. Yeah. It's... It, again, it was one that was like really early in the year. Uh, so I was mm-hmm. like, I was worried it would get forgotten. So Dustin, I'm glad you remembered it to bring it up. Like stylistic. You, <laughs> Say again. <laughs> I said, I got you, boo. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It, um, yeah, it, it was really inventive in its storytelling and like playing through the styles and like the way that they kind of matched the person to the style that they were doing. Um, not to mention, I have been on the get Sam Richardson in a romantic comedy or as the romantic lead of something for nearly 10 years now. So like the fact that he's like breaking out now and people are like, Hey, have you heard of Sam Richardson? I was like, welcome. Get in the This was his year for real. Yes, he had a wonderful, wonderful year. And he's- Pocus too. You know, he just didn't have that that, uh, senior year. He's been in a couple other things too. And it's like, wow, Mm -hmm. those are some pretty big projects to be noticed in. Yeah, no, he's fantastic. And I'm just, I'm so glad that he's finally positioned where like more people can see him. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he was great. Ben Schwartz was great. Tiffany has like everybody was so, so good. And yeah, it was just, it was such a fun watch and exciting to go to see like, what form are they going to do next? How are they going to pull this out? So fun. There's even Mm -hmm. a whole animated episode, which is y'all got me going to get this Apple TV plus. That's all I got to say. It's one of the cheaper streamers though. I will give you that. It is. (laughs) And also, I mean, there is a critical mass of great stuff on it now, right? Like they've got, a library of like a pretty deep bench of their own stuff. Right. Which is the thing with Apple TV. Yeah. It's not, they don't have like a lot of other stuff, but um, for all mankind also real good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I should have put it in my, yeah. Schmigadoon. Oh, Schmigadoon. Oh, Schmigadoon. I, I feel different. Season coming out, so. I feel differently about Schmigadoon, but I respect your choices. <laughs> um, I do want to say, well, that being Amma. said, those are, uh, yes. Oh, I was going to say, so Ama, there is a Sam Richardson rom-com. It also stars Brittany Snow. It's called Hooking Up. You can see it on Hulu. It is a delight. It's on my <laughs> list. It's on my list. I've been, that's all I've been, all I've been wanting in this world for him. Okay. He's, he's been ready. <laughs> so... I got to go Absolutely. watch it. But there you go. So thank you for that, Delia. And those are our picks. Did you watch any of them? Do you have opinions? Is there something else that we missed? This episode is just the beginning of the discussion. Let us know your favorites on social media and at greatpopculturedebate.com. A big thank you to our panelists. It's always a pleasure to talk TV with you brilliant, funny people. And I want to say thank you especially to our guests, Delia and Dustin. Please make sure that you check out their other projects. We are really, truly grateful that you guys gave up your night to talk with us. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to check Check out the other great pop culture debate best of 2022 episodes devoted to music, books, and film, and all releasing between now and the new year. Make sure you're subscribed to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever else you listen to podcasts, and that you follow us on all your social media accounts for all the latest news. And if you haven't yet supported us on Patreon, what are you waiting for? There are so many great perks, and we'd love to have you as part of our little pod family. And you'd better buckle up because Great Pop Culture Debate has plenty in store for you in 2023. Head to greatpopculturedebate.com right now to vote on the polls for Season 7. We're talking talking best share song, best TV detective, best queer film, best Disney park ride. I just put up a couple other ones, best eighties cartoon, best film of 1999. There's 10 in in all. Uh, So uh, make sure you take those polls. They close at the beginning of January. Then in late January, we'll be releasing our Patreon sponsored episodes, which include best children's board game, best song of 1985, best, best actress, Oscar winner, and best America's next top model photo shoot. So fun. We look forward to an amazing 2023 and remember everyone is entitled to the wrong opinions. 